Yes, Ms. Orr. Commissioner, the final witness in relation to the Suncorp case study is Mr. Philip Field from the Financial Ombudsman Service. Yes, Mr. Field, do come into the witness box. Uh, Mr. Field, would you prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? Uh, an affirmation, Commissioner. Affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Yes, uh, please take a seat, Mr. Field. Full name is Philip Field. A Philip Andrew Field. A Philip Andrew Field. Philip Andrew Field. Now, Mr. Field, you're here pursuant to a summons from the Commission. Yes. Have you got the original of the summons with you? Yes, I do. I tender that, Commissioner. Uh, I think Exhibit 3.83. Uh, will be the summons to Mr Field. Now, Mr Field, you've made two witness statements in response to rubric 3-27. The first one is in response to section A and the second is in response to section B. Have you got the originals of those with you? I do. Okay, just turning to the first one in response to section A. Um, it's undated, but it was signed on the 18th of May. Is that and uh, there are no corrections you wish to make to that? No. And are the contents of it true and correct? Yes. I tender that, Commissioner. The witness statement of Mr Field, Part A, 18 May 18, is Exhibit 3.84. Do, do you, sorry, do you wish me to date it? Because it... Commissioner? Uh, it's probably as well to uh, date at the date on which it was signed, Mr no, thank Field. You. Thank you. I tender that, Commissioner. Yes, 3.84. Yes, 3.84. Oh. Okay. Mr Field, do you have the uh, original of the witness statement in response to Section B? Uh, yes. Uh, and that was also um, signed on the 18th of May? Yes. Would you please just go to the back of it and put the date that it was signed, the 18th of May? Are its contents true and correct? Yes. Any corrections you want to make to it? No. I tender that, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.85, witness statement of Mr Field, Part B, 18 May 18. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Wise. Yes, Ms Hall. Mr Field, you are the lead ombudsman, banking and finance of the Financial Ombudsman Service. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and you've been put forward by the Financial Ombudsman Service, or FOS, as it's, as it's commonly known, uh, to give evidence about two complaints made to FOS by Mr Ryan Lowe on behalf of his mother, Jennifer Lowe? That's correct. Uh, were you present for the evidence of Mr Ryan Lowe, Mr Yes, Field? I was. And were you present for the evidence of Mr Carter from Ye Suncorp? Yes, I was. Thank you. Now, I want to start with some uh, more general questions about FOS before yes. moving to the, the Lowe complaints. FOS is authorised by ASIC to be an external dispute resolution service for financial service providers, is that right? That's right. Uh, and financial service providers are required by their licensing conditions to be members of an EDR scheme such as that provided by FOS. That's correct. And FOS is free for applicants to use? Yes. Uh, but financial service providers have to pay a membership fee? Uh, a membership fee and... Um uh, a levy and case fees. It's a, it's a mixture of, of a funding model. A levy in case fees, did you say? Uh, so there's a, there's a membership fee. Yes. Uh, and then there are case fees based on the, uh, the individual cases that come to us. Yes. And then there's another levy based on their case experience in the, in the previous year. Is that based on the number of cases involved in, in the previous year? I believe so, yes. Okay. And from the 1st of November this year, a new body will provide the EDR scheme uh, to deal with complaints from consumers in the financial system. That's the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, or AFCA. That's correct. And, Af and AFCA will replace FODS? Yes. 
and the other schemes that currently exist, which are the Credit and Investments Ombudsman and the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal. That's correct. Uh, and FOS has terms of reference which outline how it deals with disputes. Yes. You've annexed those to your statement as Exhibit 2. They require FOS to act in an efficient, timely and fair manner. Yes, that's correct. And when making a determination, the terms of reference tell us that FOS is to have regard to the legal principles, industry codes or guidance, good industry practice and relevant FOS decisions. Uh, it's uh, fair in all the circumstances having regard to those matters, yes. <laughs> now, there are detailed manuals and procedures at FOS to ensure staff and the Ombudsman apply a consistent approach, is that right? Yes. And you say in your statement that the specific process in any given case will depend on the circumstances and what the FOS caseworker decides is the most appropriate way for that particular dispute to be resolved. That, that's correct. So it might involve um, some um, shuttle negotiation or a telephone conciliation um, to see if the matter can be resolved, but ultimately if it doesn't, it would proceed to a decision on the merits. And you tell us in your statement that most financial services providers is, are very familiar with the FOS process. Um, uh, I suppose, yes, I, suppose I perhaps should clarify that. Most of the regular users, you know, the, pe the, the entities that have um, uh, multiple complaints are familiar with the process, but there are, of course, members who only have one or two who are less familiar with the, with the process. And what about Suncorp, the entity that... Oh, Suncorp would be familiar with the, the process, yes. And you'd also tell us in your statement that most applicants are not familiar with the FOS process. That, that's correct, yes. And most applicants don't have the assistance of a lawyer in the process? No, that's yes, that's correct. And they're likely to have very limited resources in comparison to the financial services provider about whose conduct they're complaining? That's correct, yes. So how does FOS assist applicants through the process? We do it by um, um, explaining, uh, so, so <clears throat> when we receive a complaint and it proceeds through to uh, a caseworker handling it, the caseworker will have an initial telephone conversation uh, with the applicant to discuss the issues in dispute uh, and to try and identify what sort of information we might need um, to help try and resolve that dispute. Um, we'll explain the process and then we'll confirm that in writing so they'll, they'll get a letter, usually in an email, but in a letter attached to an email that would set out our understanding of the dispute and what further information we need from uh, the applicant in order to, to get a better understanding of it. And FOS can resolve disputes in a number of different ways? Uh, yes, mo most disputes, about 80% of disputes, are resolved um, without the need for a decision. And uh, so that will involve, as, a, as I said before, some, you know, some telephone shuttle negotiation between the parties um, uh, or a telephone conciliation. Uh, we, we might provide uh, a recommendation, which is a, a more formal document, or alternatively, we might pr provide a preliminary view, which is usually done over the telephone. Uh, and if necessary, it might be confirmed in writing. And uh, if the matter isn't resolved through any of those stages, then it would proceed to an ombudsman for a determination. And a determination is a written decision yes, setting it... out the ombudsman's findings. Yes. It... Uh, and the details of any redress that's to be provided by the financial services provider. Yes. Uh, and a FOS determination of an ombudsman is binding, <coughs> excuse me, binding on the financial services provider if the app accepts it. That's correct. And the financial services provider doesn't have a choice whether that, to accept or reject a determination. That's a matter solely for the applicant. That's correct. Okay. Now, if the applicant does not accept the determination, the financial services provider is not bound that's correct, because the matter could proceed to court and be dealt with um, through that court process. And if the applicant accepts the determination, uh, they must provide the financial services provider with a binding release in relation to the matters resolved by the determination? Uh, they can if the financial services provider asks for it. So our usual process is if the customer accepts, we'll get an email um, 
confirming their acceptance, that's usually uh, acceptable, but in some cases a financial services provider might require a more formal document um, and, and they're entitled to do that under the terms of reference. And how often does that happen, Mr Field? Um, uh, it happens often enough, but I, I would say in most cases it's not required, but it does happen. And if it does happen, if the financial services provider asks for a binding release, mm. the applicant has to give it under your terms of reference, is that right? That, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And the release is for the full value of the claim that's the subject of the dispute? Yes, it's to resolve the dispute in full and final settlement. Uh, even if the amount uh, of the claim exceeds the amount that FOS ordered? Uh, yes, that would be correct. That is. And the release is effective from the date the financial services provider does what it's required to do under the determination. Is that right? Uh, th that, would, that would be the effect of, of the deed, yes. All right. Now, I, I want to ask you some questions about the remedies that FOS can uh, award in a FOS determination. They're set out in your terms of reference, which are Exhibit 2 to Part A of your statement. I'd like to go to that. So that's um, FOS 0033 0001 0002. And if we turn to, if we could have 0020 and 0021 both on the screen, that would be helpful. <coughs> so it's clause nine of the, term, the terms of reference, 9.1 lists types of remedies and we see there that they include the payment of a sum of money, the forgiveness or variation of a debt, the release of security for a debt, re-waiver or variation of a fee or other amount, reinstatement or rectification of a contract and variation of the terms of a credit contract in cases of financial hardship. Now, a credit contract is a contract regulated by the NCCPA, regulated by the NCCPA, the National Consumer Credit Protection Act. That's how that term is defined in the terms of yes. reference, yes. Thank you. Uh, now, this is an inclusive list of remedies we see from the chapeau to that provision, is yes. that right? Yes, it is. So it's not exhaustive. Correct. But there's no reference there to FOS voiding a contract. Um, no, there isn't. And does FOS have power to void a contract? Ooh, um, that's an interesting question. It's, it's certainly not in the list, um, but uh, and it's, I don't think it's in my mind to. Have you ever made uh, an order attempting to void a contract, Mr Field? Attempting to void a contract. Um, I think that perhaps I would probably release the applicant from the obligation. I don't know whether that's the same as voiding it, but it would probably have the same effect as far as that applicant is concerned. What sort of obligation would you release the applicant from? Um, so, from so if there's a a loan contract that um, they've entered into, um, that I consider that they shouldn't be liable for. So an example would be a situation where somebody has been made um, a, a co-borrower when they should be a guarantor and they haven't received the benefits of being a guarantor. So in those circumstances, we would say that they're not liable to um, uh, to repay the, 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 the amount due under the contract. So releasing them from a particular obligation under the loan contract, yes. which is different from voiding the contract, do you accept that? Yes. All right. Uh, so you haven't, as far as you recall, ever made an order that voids a contract? I, I can't think of a circumstances, but there have been a lot of cases over the years, yes. But just to be clear, you can't recall I, I can't recall one, those. no, no. Thank no, I can't. You. 
And there are limits on what FOS can award in compensation for direct financial loss or damage, is that right? That's correct. Uh, and we see um, within this terms of reference that the cap is 323,500 for most disputes for yeah. direct financial loss, is that right? That's right, okay. and it increased this year from $309,000. It previously was 309 and is now 323,500. Yes. And once FOS has made its determination, there's no further appeal or review process within FOS? Uh, at, under the terms of reference, the determination is final, yes. But an applicant can challenge a FOS determination in court? Uh, if, if they choose to do so, yes. And how often does that happen? Uh, that an applicant challenges um, a determination uh, very rarely. All right, now before we turn to the Lowe's case, as a general issue, can you please explain FOS's uh, approach to assessing a complaint that there has been maladministration in respect of a small business loan? In respect of a small business loan? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so, when we look at, uh, a, in a small business loan situation, we will look at um, whether or not we believe the bank has um, met the, what we believe is the standard of a diligent and prudent lender. Um, we do that by, I guess, looking for what we call red flags. So is there information on the lending file which would indicate to a prudent lender that they should make further inquiries about um, what, what's being applied for and what's going on? Uh, and then having formed uh, that view, we, we will decide whether or not the, we believe the bank has met that particular uh, obligation. If there is a complaint of that nature, how does FOS approach a bank's assessment of serviceability of a small business loan? So we, we have uh, within our office uh, banking specialists, which are... Uh, people with experience in doing credit assessments and we essentially get them to reassess the proposal and to look at uh, the information received, go through the, the business case or uh, other documents that were received and provide uh, and do an analysis of that and provide us with an opinion about whether or not on that information, um, whether or not a diligent or prudent lender would have entered into that loan. So how does FOS approach a bank's reliance um, on cash flow forecasts where there's evidence that the forecast was either not realistic or not accurate? So our, our specialist will go through and make that um, assessment to see whether or not they um, would, would agree that that cash flow um, could lead a diligent and prudent banker to, to, make, uh, to come to that conclusion. And if FOS finds that there has been maladministration, how does FOS assess the applicant's loss? So our approach in a small business situation is that the bank is responsible for the credit decision. So uh, we say that it shouldn't profit from that credit decision. So it, it doesn't receive interest and the, and the fees associated. Um, but we say that <clears throat> the, the customer is wearing uh, the business risk and, or the investment risk. So the bank's not there. Um, helping them running the business day by day, making decisions about cash flow and how to spend money. So the customer's responsible for that. So our assessment is that it's fair in all the circumstances that the customer be relieved of the, the interest liability. FOS has published guidance in relation to responsible lending disputes. Yes, we have. Uh, and one paper in the Responsible Lending series published by FOS is a paper entitled How We Work Out a Consumer's Loss. Are you familiar yes. with that paper? Yes. Now, could I ask that you be shown that document? It's FOS 0006 0002 0407. Now, uh, this is that document, is that right, Mr that, Field? That's correct, yes. Now, if we could turn to 0408 and have 0408 and 0409 on the screen together. 
we see there a reflection of the evidence that you've just given in the final paragraph on the first page. The FSP is liable for the credit risk of its lending decision. Generally, it is not liable for the consumer's investment risk in how the consumer uses the loan funds. Therefore, if the consumer used the loan funds for investments, such as shares, or for their business, usually the consumer will have to repay at least the principal amount the FSP lent to them, even if the value of the investment has gone down. In those cases, the consumer's loss is usually only the interest and fees they paid to the FSP. Yes. Thank you. Now, if we turn to 0410, we see under the heading, the FOS approach, if we decide that an FSP has not lent responsibly, we will consider what amount of the loan the consumer is liable to repay. Consumers who believe their FSP did not make a responsible decision to lend to them often say their debt should be written off, which means that they would not have to repay the loan. However, we do not take that approach. That again, I think, is consistent with the evidence you've just given, Mr Field. Correct. And finally, could we turn to 0414 in this document, which relates to loans specifically used for business purposes? Do you see there under clause 2.7, when the FSP provides a loan to a consumer for the consumer's business, the consumer often decides how they will use the loan funds in their business. In those cases, the consumer will have to repay the loan and their loss is only the interest and fees they have paid to the FSP? Yes. Now, there is nothing in this guidance, is there, about how quickly an applicant will have to repay a loan that is found by FOS to be irresponsible? No, there isn't. Now, I want to come to talking to you about what FOS's position on that is, yes. but first I tender this document, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.86 will be FOS Responsible Lending Series, how we assess customer loss, FOS 0006, 0002, 0407. Now, perhaps if I could ask you some questions now by reference to the Lowe's complaint. Yes. Uh, now, the original complaint from uh, Mr Lowe on behalf of his mother was about maladministration in relation to five loans advanced by Suncorp. Yes. And you made the determination uh, that one of the loans, a business loan that you referred to as business loan B, uh, was affected by maladministration. Yes. Uh, now, you found that Suncorp had acted irresponsibly when it approved that loan. Yes. And you heard the evidence uh, on Friday when I referred to the parts of the determination that contained your reasons for yes. that decision. Yes. Uh, now, can I just take you back to that determination, which is Exhibit 2021 to your statement, FOS 0028 Now, could we go to zero, I'm sorry, to 3076 in this document? Uh, and we see there under the heading, what is the applicant's loss? In keeping with FOS's public, published approach to loss, the applicant is not entitled to total debt forgiveness. I agree with the case manager's method of calculation of loss as set out in the recommendation section 2.4, which has been updated in this determination. Um, now, the published, the published approach to loss referred to there is the document we've just looked at, is that right? Yes. Uh, and the case manager's method of calculation of loss was to um, forgive the interest that had been repaid yes. and not permit further charging of interest or fees on this loan. Yes. Thank you. Now, I want to go on now to what followed from that finding that you made under the heading determination. Now, you heard my questions to Mr Carter about this part of the determination. Yes. And can we start with me asking you to explain what 
you understand the effect of these, of these paragraphs in the determination to be? And just before you answer that, could we have 3077 brought up on the other side of the screen so that you can see the entirety of those paragraphs? So what is the effect of these paragraphs, Mr Field? <laughs> So the effect is that loan B was reduced and that interest was no longer payable on that. Um, because dealing with a customer in default, uh, there needed to be some um, arrangement to repay the existing uh, uh, loans because the first four loans, as you were recall, were, were OK and they still continued to accrue interest and needed to be needed to have payments made. So essentially what it was saying is that the parties need to um, come to some arrangement to repay uh, the loans um, and it also referred to the FSP having obligations under the Code of Banking Practice to try and work with their customer to help overcome their financial difficulty. Why do you say this was a customer in default? Uh, because, by, at, at <clears throat> by the, because the first f four loans um, were... Uh, were in arrears because, um, so, sorry, so default is probably not the, the correct phrase because a demand had not been served, sorry, um, but they were certainly in arrears, so there needed to be some arrangement made in order to clear those arrears so that there would not be a further default, sorry, quite correct. Does FOS take the view that a loan that's found to have been the subject of maladministration comes to an end? Uh, no. And are you aware of what Mr Carter described on Friday as an industry practice that where FOS determines a loan to be affected by maladministration, the applicant will need to pay that loan back in its entirety in a short time frame such as 6 to 12 months? So I think he was referring to our approach in relation to uh, the situation involving a home loan. Uh, rather than, than this particular instance. So our sit the way we approach uh, loss on a home loan is that um, a customer who receives a loan, um, <clears throat> a customer who receives a loan that they shouldn't have got has acquired uh, a property. Uh, and in order to put them back into the position that they would have been in had that not happened, um, they wouldn't have the loan, but they also wouldn't have the property. So we, we assess... Uh, we take into account the fact that um, they wouldn't have incurred the interest on that loan, so they, that comes off the debt. Um, they wouldn't have incurred if they bought the property after the loan was granted the stamp duty and associated legal costs uh, with that, and um, they wouldn't have incurred the holding costs such as uh, insurance and rates. Um, we also then take into account the fact that um, they would have had to have lived somewhere else if they didn't have that property, so we, we reduce the amount of compensation by a notional rent and we arrive at a figure uh, that we say their debt should now be. And coming back to that starting point, that to put them in the position that they wouldn't have been in, they wouldn't have had the loan but they wouldn't have had the house, um, what we say is that the customer needs to um, take action to sell the house, but if they choose to keep it, they may wish to refinance it. So do you say that you're not aware of any industry practice that where FOS determines a small business loan to be affected by maladministration, the applicant needs to pay it back in its entirety well, it, within it, a short period of time? It, it's going to depend on it on, on the particular circumstances of, of the case and the particular um, particular applicant. Uh, well, that it's a slightly different matter. I, I want yes. to know if oh. you're aware of an industry practice. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I couldn't say I'm aware of an industry practice, but I could understand that Suncorp might understand that there was coming out of our approach to that consumer um, housing situation that I talked about. But that's not what this situation was, was it? No. No. Um, so as far as you're aware, there wasn't an industry practice um, that warranted the action taken by Suncorp in relation to recovering this loan? Uh, not, not, not an industry practice, no. Well, what's the position of FOS 
on how quickly a loan that's affected by maladministration that's a small business loan should have to be paid back? Well, paid back. Uh, it's going to depend on the customer's circumstances. So if the person's in financial difficulty, what we expect the financial services provider financial services provider to do is to actually understand what the customer situation is. Now there may there may be assets that could be sold there. Um, they may have now got income from another source. So really it's a question about understanding what the customer's position is and trying to work out what the best way forward. Now as I said that might involve the sale of assets and, and so the answer might be that um, the person requires time in order to get that property on the market and sell it. So um, it could vary between, um, you know, three or six months, as, as Suncorp said, but it, it could take longer depending on the nature of the customer's individual circumstances. Is the use of the loan funds by the applicant relevant to the approach of FOS to that question? Uh, no, not at all. The customers use the funds, that's why they're required, we say, to, to pay it back. But how they use them is really, really not relevant at all. Um, why does FOS require an applicant uh, who has received a loan that FOS has determined to be irresponsibly advanced to commence negotiations with the financial services provider about a repayment plan? We've just, we decide what their liability is, but they still maintain that banker-customer relationship and they still have that relationship with their bank. So, um, you know, we've, we've resolved the dispute about maladministration. It's not readily apparent at that stage that there will be a dispute about um, financial difficulty. So we, you know, we, we basically say, well, we've resolved our dispute. Now you go back and negotiate with your bank um, about how that ought to be repaid. But it's not easy for applicants to negotiate with banks, is it, particularly when they rarely have lawyers, as you've recognised? I, I understand that, but uh, customers so customers often negotiate with their banks, um, even before coming to FOS, um, about, their, about their financial difficulty, and banks have an obligation under the Code of Banking Practice to work with their customers. So there are lots of situations going on uh, even as we speak, where customers are negotiating with their banks trying to come to some sort of arrangement. Well, why can't FOS work out what a reasonable outcome is for the repayment of the debts? Uh, we could, but uh, you know, I, there's, it's not readily apparent at that stage that there's going to be a dispute about that. So, as I said, it comes back to um, you know, the, the customer and the bank working together as, as the bank is required to do under the Code of Banking Practice to, to come to some arrangement. If, if ultimately that arrangement falls over or, or they don't come to an arrangement, then there would be a, another dispute about their financial difficulty. If they are indeed in financial difficulty as opposed to a terms about how it ought to be repaid. Would a proposal by an applicant to repay the loan by continuing to make uh, repayments of principal, not interest, uh, for the life of the loan be reasonable? Uh, are you talking generally or in yes. relation to the particular low dispute? I'm talking generally. Well, I, I, again, it would depend on, on, on the circumstances and whether or not they were in arrears and whether or not that would that that situation would, would cover the arrears. You'd have to assess it on an individual case. So let's assume no arrears and let's assume an offer by the applicant to continue repaying the principal for the life of the loan, regular repayments of principal. Would that be a reasonable proposal? Uh, I, I think um, I, I think that it, it, it would be and it's probably in accordance with um, um, the effect of the determination that uh, that has been made, relieving them of that, provided of course that that is the only loan that um, needs to be repaid because obviously you know, there can be other loans that are required to be repaid with principal. So FOS's position is that if it's the only loan uh, and an applicant who is not in arrears offers to make regular repayments of the principal for the life of the loan, that would be a reasonable payment proposal? I think that's something that ought to be considered having regard to the customer's ability to make those payments. Is it a reasonable payment repayment proposal? It, it's, 
Yes, I, I suppose I suppose it is. Okay. And an applicant is told by these paragraphs of the determination. Can I ask firstly, are these standard paragraphs or were these paragraphs that were created specifically uh, I, for I, the low? I, I think that that's probably a, a, a standard. There are probably a couple of standard paragraphs that get used, but that that is probably one of them, yes. So an applicant who gets these standard paragraphs... Um, is told that if they can't get the bank to agree to a reasonable arrangement to repay the debts, then the FSP may commence recovery action. Uh, they may be able to. Mm -hmm. And they're also told that they could lose their property, such as the land or a business or a business towards which the loan went. Yes. Um, and on what basis would the financial services provider be able to commence that recovery action? If, if there was a default... In the, in the repayments of, of what was then outstanding. And that's pursuant to the terms of the existing loan contract. That's that correct, right? yes. Uh, now, what, are the situation, what is the situation when there are multiple loans, such as uh, happened here, uh, and only one, or perhaps more than one, uh, is found to have been irresponsibly lent? Uh, does FOS take the position that a debt from a loan obtained through maladministration has to be repaid before the debts that were responsibly incurred. Uh, I'm sorry. I, no, I, 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 I think it, what, what you're. I think what you're suggesting is what's the order of risk. So where there are multiple loans, yes. some of which were subject to maladministration and others were not. Yes. So if there if if there is a say a lump sum payment made. Um, that that lump sum payment should go to the interest-bearing loans before the interest-free loan. Right. So FOS's position is that the financial service provider um, uh, should apply money advanced from the applicant uh, towards the uh, repayment of the loans that were responsibly lent before the loan that was irresponsibly lent. Yes, the, the, you may have an irresponsible. Um, the, the other scenario is where there's a refinance. So you, you know, you already had that obligation beforehand, um, even though the the next one was irresponsible because there was, um, you know, it was replacing an obligation you already had. You, you'd still have to pay it. But essentially, that's that's correct. What you're saying is correct. And why does FOS adopt that position? Uh, which position? The position that you've just articulated, which is that the money should be applied to the um, debts from the loans that oh, were yes. responsibly lent and are interest-bearing before um, the interest-free, irresponsibly lent uh, loans. Because the interest-bearing ones have the, the greatest burden, I suppose, on the consumer. So um, it seems appropriate to me that you um, apply the funds to the, that loan which has the greatest burden. And does FOS make that position known to financial services providers? Um, it's not in our, our current approach, but when we first started looking at maladministration, it was in um, well, it was before FOS, it was at the Banking Ombudsman. Um, we issued a bulletin in relation to uh, the credit card scenario um, where the, the approach we took was that if you were given a credit card um, that was inappropriate or above a, a limit that was appropriate, that we would reconstruct the account to say that the... And perhaps I could, I could start again. If you were given a credit card of, say, $5,000 and the bank made an unsolicited credit card limit offer to you without assessing your capacity to repay of $7,000, which was inappropriate, we, we said that you've got to pay the $5,000 with interest but the 2000 is interest-free. And then we would um, recalculate the account so that, um, so that all the payments that have been made were applied to the interest-bearing component first and leaving the interest-free. So th that, that informs our approach. It, that bulletin is still on our website but hidden away in the archive section. Um, so I, I'm not so sure that FSPs know that that's the current approach necessarily, but that, that's where we come from. Did you hear the evidence from Mr Carter on Friday that he understood that FOS had the opposite approach, that FOS required uh, the debt that was the subject of the loan that was from maladministration to be paid off first? I, 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 don't, I don't recall hearing him say that. If that was his position, is that incorrect? 
Um, uh, it, it, it would be if, if he'd asked me, yes. Yes, and do you think that FOS ought to make clear in its guidance that its expectation is that debts from responsible lending are paid off before debts from irresponsible y lending? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, now, the FOS determination which was uh, in Mrs Lowe's favour in relation to business loan B has essentially resulted, as you heard from Mr Carter and Mr Lowe's evidence, in an acceleration of Mrs Lowe's repayments on the loan. Yes. And is that fair to Mrs Lowe in circumstances where she appears to have gone into the FOS process with a loan with Suncorp with a remaining term of over 20 years? Uh, th th this is this is an unusual case. Um, so um, it, it's a situation where all of the um, interest-bearing loans have been repaid, um, uh, leaving the interest-free one, and it's it's not one that I can readily recall coming up. Um, so um, <clears throat> I, you know, I think I is it is it fair? Um, I, Certainly the way the, the cards fell in this case, I think she would be entitled to do so. Um, entitled to? Pay it off um, by instalments, mm -hmm. um, if she could afford to do so. Do so. My, my only concern is around the f fact that there's a, you've got a person who's 62 who would be making payments until they're 80. Um, and so I would have concerns about the sustainability of that, but... Um, Provided that, um, pr you know, provided that she could afford to make the payments over that long period, um, I, I think she'd be entitled to do so. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason then why you conveyed to uh, the Consumer Action Law Centre yes. when they contacted you to discuss this uh, that 17 years wasn't a reasonable time frame to repay the debt? Well, well, what I had in mind was that situation where you had somebody who was in their 60s paying it till they're, till they're 80. Um, and, and certainly, from my perspective, if a bank were to lend to somebody in that scenario, I would regard that as, as not reasonable. And, and that's, that was my frame of mind at, at that particular time. But the solution to that, Mr Field, can't be to require Mrs Lowe to pay $220,000 in six months, can it? Um, uh, no, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that six months would be reasonable in that circumstance, no. Well, you conveyed to the Consumer Action Law Centre and to Suncorp uh, that uh, 12 to 18 months to repay the loan would be reasonable? Yes, and, and that five years would be, be the outer limit. And again, my frame of mind was more around, um, more around the, a person in that, in that situation making payments until they're 80 and whether or not that was sustainable. Do you accept, Mr Field, that what you conveyed to the parties in relation to this second FOS complaint had a, a big impact on the way the parties conducted themselves thereafter uh, yes, I, to resolve this I, dispute? Yes, I, I do accept that, Miss Lowe, yes. And uh, do you think it was the right thing for you to have done to have conveyed to the parties that 12 to eight, 18 months was reasonable and five years was the outer limit? I, I, in hindsight, I, I don't think that was the correct thing to do. I think I should have um, accepted uh, what that the, the, the calc position was correct and, and got on the phone to the bank then and there to, um, to try and, and resolve the matter. As it was, I said to calc, continue in negotiations um, if you know, if you get closer back to me, and I'll I'll call then. But in hindsight, I should have called the bank earlier to have. And what should you have said to the bank on I, that call? I should have said that. Um, well, if she, you know, if she's entitled. She, once the arrears were cleared, um, on on and and at that the time of that call, um, uh, it was a it, from the information I had was that, um, the 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 interest-bearing loans would be cleared, um, <clears throat> but provided the arrears, any arrears on the interest-free loan were also cleared, then if she could make those payments, she was entitled to do so and it would be interest-free until it was paid off. You were aware, weren't you, that uh, 
Mrs Lowe was offering to pay $1,101 a month for the life of the loan, which was more than the existing repayment schedule. I was aware she was offering to repay that. I can't recall if it was more than the existing repayment schedule. Yes, and you now accept, I think, that um, your response to that, which was that 12 to 18 months or five years was the outer limit of any repayments, was wrong? Yes, I do. Okay. What, what do you say to the proposition that if applicants knew that uh, success in FOS looked, laws looked like what Mrs Lowe experienced, they would be deterred from making a complaint to FOS? Well, th th this is an unusual case. Um, it's not one that I've seen. And, in, you know, we, we do try very hard to ensure that the outcome that the customer gets is, is fair in all the circumstances. And I would encourage them still to to uh, to come and use our service, which, as you said at the start, is free of charge to them. Charge to them. Um, and you know, we we have staff that try very very hard to ensure that we get the right outcome. Mm -hmm. But in this out, in this case, it resulted in an acceleration of Mrs Lowe's loan repayments in a way that was unfair to her. It, it could have, but it, because as I understand from the evidence, the matter has not yet been that's resolved. Right. But, but it could have. You're yes, you're aware that's the position that the bank is taking with Mrs Lowe. Uh, the bank, that's the position they're taking. But having uh, you know reflected on the file, um, it's certainly not a position I think that they could continue to take. I see. It, I see. In my view. I see. So you would expect them to change their position and now permit Mrs Lowe to make principal, regular principal repayments for the life of the loan? Um, uh, yes. Uh, in fact, she might even be ahead at the moment because if there was a twenty, twenty or thirty thousand dollar surplus that the banks retained, then that would actually um, cover her payments for um, you know twenty or thirty months. So she might actually be ahead. Putting that to one side, yes. just in answer to my question, Sorry. Would, would you expect the bank to now change their position and permit Mrs Lowe uh, to make principal repayments on a regular basis for the life of the loan? Yes, I would. Thank you. Now, will FOS's approach to responsible lending disputes for small businesses be used as the basis for AFCA's approach to those matters? Uh, I, I would imagine so initially and, and then... Um uh, as as um, <coughs> uh, as as the bodies come together, particularly the CIO that uh, and FOS, that we would have discussions about the various different approaches, um, and, and you know see what may need to be uh, modified or changed to accommodate um, the various approaches. Um, how do you think, given your experience in the position you have? How do you think that AFCA uh, should approach responsible lending outcomes for loans to small businesses? Uh, I, well, I believe the FOS approach um, is one that we've given a lot of thought to and um, it seems to me that uh, it would form an appropriate basis for, for AFCA subject to um, you know, any modification and evolution of that approach as, over time. Thank you. I have no further questions for Mr Field, Commissioner. Thank you. No re-examination. Yes, is uh, anyone here representing Suncorp? Yes. yes no None from Suncorp? No, I'm uh, rather expecting you to be at the bar table, and uh, but thank you. Uh, very well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Field. Um, you may step down. You're excused further attendance. Th thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Oh, do you... Commissioner, we're now moving to a different topic within the hearings involving a uh, different party at the bar table. Would the Did commission I come back at uh, 22? Thank you, uh, Commissioner. 11.